As a former U.S. citizen, I am, of course, no longer entitled to a U.S. passport. And so the question that a number of folks have asked me or that friends in years past have even ribbed me about is, you know, if you're not a U.S. citizen, aren't you going to have fewer travel opportunities than other Western citizens, than other people? What I'm going to share with you today is my own experience of countries that I can no longer visit. I'm going to walk you through my methodology for what it's like to uh, have a lesser passport or lesser passports and some ideas I think you can apply if you are considering leaving your country and giving up your passport, if you think you may need to in the future, or if you're just curious how it all works. Hey guys, I'm Andrew Henderson, and here at Nomad Capitals, we help successful entrepreneurs and investors go where they're treated best with everything from offshore tax planning to reduce their tax bill, second passports to diversify and expand their options, opportunities in new boom markets to make more money. And you know, one of the things uh, that I wanted to do in being a global citizen was I had to untether myself from a system that, number one, I just didn't personally feel good in, didn't personally feel connected to. Uh, but that also put a lot of rules on me. Forget taxes. Everyone always talks about taxes. But I had a lot of rules and regulations put on me in terms of all the investments that I make around the world and you know, how I could move my money around the world. And I just I detached myself from that. And what a lot of people have told me since then is, oh, you know, I bet you have trouble you know, traveling around the world because the U.S. passport is such a great passport. And since we work with a lot of Westerners here, uh, it's an area that I think confuses folks. It's an area that concerns folks. We have uh, every once in a while someone comes and says, hey, Andrew, I'd like to you know, get your help in, in expatriating from the U.S. myself, but I'm afraid, you know, what's life going to look like afterwards? Because, you know, as an American, I'm just so used to getting on a plane and going wherever I want to go and being let in. You know, I've never applied for a visa. You know, what's that like? And so what I'm going to do is share a list of countries. We're going to get the laptop in on this one. I'm going to share a list of countries that through my own passport portfolio, I can no longer visit that I would be able to visit uh, if it were for you know, still having a U.S. passport. And we'll uh, give some commentary along the way. Uh, so the first thing that's interesting is I've actually added about half a dozen new countries that Americans couldn't visit. Obviously, you could be a U.S. citizen and citizens of all the other countries that I'm uh, a citizen of, and you would get all of it. But certainly, you know, having second passports expands your visa-free travel in the places that you may not have already, even if you have a U.S. or Australian or Canadian passport. You know, Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela being common examples. Uh, there are some others, South Africa if you're New Zealand. Uh, but anyway, let's go through the list. Here are the countries I can no longer visit on my several passports that I maintain today. Uh, number one is Angola. Number two is Australia. Number three is Brunei, Canada, CAR, the, the Central African Republic, makes number five. Equatorial Guinea makes six. Mexico, number seven. There's a caveat. I'll come back to that. Uh, Morocco, number eight. New Zealand, nine. Ten, Papua New Guinea. Eleven, Paraguay. Twelve, Saudi Arabia. It's actually an e-visa. It's a little, they're kind of cheating on that one. Uh, and thirteen, I believe. Thirteen, uh, the United States. So I've always talked about the Kuna countries, Canada, U.S., New Zealand, and Australia. Those are the most difficult to get into. If you have um, an economic citizenship from one of the, the Commonwealth countries, like St. Lucia, in my case, Dominica, any of the Caribbean programs, Vanuatu, uh, you'll have access to the U.K. and Ireland. Uh, I have a number of passports I can get into uh, Europe. Southeast Asia is generally pretty open. Good parts of Latin America are open. And so, you know, for me, the strategy has been not just going from being a U.S. citizen to being St. Lucian, because then I wouldn't have as many travel privileges. But it, for me, it was, okay, St. Lucia was good. You know, at one point I had the, the Comoros passport. I called it a gap filler. Um, and actually, I've had some great interactions, by the way, with folks in the government in Comoros, um, just, you know, an offering to, to help them out. But, you know, then I have... Um, you know, the other citizenships that are able to, to get me into more countries. So all of that, you know, the, the belt and suspenders, as they call it, leaves me, I think we counted 13 countries that I can't go to. And so let's go through those. Angola, who cares, right? Central African Republic, I doubt you were going there. 
Equatorial Guinea? I mean, all right, once for your honeymoon maybe, but you know, I'm sure you can live without it. Um, then we have the countries where you might want to visit once. Brunei, I was there once many years ago. You know, Brunei, tiny country, surrounded by Malaysia on Borneo. Whatever you can see uh, on uh, the Malaysian side is pretty much what you're going to see in Brunei. So if you haven't been able to, to get to Brunei, you're probably not missing a lot. But uh, I did go there once, and I, I bet if I wanted to, to, you know, living in Malaysia, go to the embassy and get a visa, I could. Um, Mexico, I actually had a residence permit in Mexico before expatriate, and I could have changed that over. And I actually have uh, another way that I can get into Mexico with a non-passport. Um, Mexico is one of the many countries, if you have certain visas or certain residence permits, you can actually get in there without a visa. Um, and so that's worth considering. Uh, Morocco, it's worth a visit or two. You can get a visa pretty easily. Um, Actually, Papua New Guinea should be in the list. You probably don't care, but also Paraguay, you could get a visa. You can set up a residence permit there if you wanted to. Uh, Saudi Arabia has an e-visa project. Um, so after you exclude the countries, like the Moroccos, that would be nice to go to once, in which case you will, wherever you're living, fill out a one or two page form, go down to the embassy, wait in line, pay $38, come back the next day or four days later and get your visa, go there, no issues at all. They don't care if you're Dominican, Nivanawatu, American, or from Timbuktu. Uh, after you exclude the ones you don't care about and those, the easy visas, you are essentially left with the countries that I always talk about, which is CUNA, CUNA, Canada, US, New Zealand, and Australia. Can you get visas to those countries? Yes, it's not gonna be a matter of going down and giving a one page form to a disinterested person who just wants to put the sticker in and go to lunch. Uh, it's gonna be a bit more involved. Um, and so, you know, the question that, that I've posed before is, can you live without these four countries? Or can you live with dealing with the hassle of getting back into those, those four countries? Now, uh, all of those four countries have uh, various um, ways that you can get a residence permit in their country, generally by making an investment. It's not gonna be cheap. Uh, you can do that, or you can get a visa. You know, generally speaking, if you have money, uh, if you have some stability in your life, you're not just a, a homeless nomad, uh, you can get visas to these countries, okay? And so this is what it looks like, you know, not being a Westerner. I think that some people have kind of imagined that I have some, you know, because I'm the nomad capitalist, there's some magic pixie dust that makes me immune to the visa rules of the world. And really what I've chosen to do is to be a citizen of peaceful countries, um, that I either you know, agree with their approach to bringing an investment to their country and, and doing what it takes to, to survive in this competitive world, uh, or I actually physically like them and I enjoy you know, being a citizen and I feel connected to them. Uh, and by doing that, I've been able to essentially give myself the same travel with a minor inconvenience once in a while. Uh, now, you know, if you're a citizen of a Western country, there are probably some other kinds of restrictions or regulations or taxes put on you, or there may be in the near future. And so uh, I understand that going and waiting in line and getting a visa, you know, those of us from the Western world, it, it almost feels like, like you're slumming it, right? I almost think it's embarrassing when I talk to folks, they're like, I've never had to apply for a visa. Like, hey, who do you think I am? Or, you know, maybe you had to apply for a visa to China or Russia or something, which again, having a second passport can, can get you into those countries. I bet you'd rather go to Moscow than the Central African Republic. I don't know. That's just me. Um, but if you can get past the part of, you know, once a year having to go and wait in a line for, for an hour, I think your life is probably a lot more simple. For me, I can tell you, I just feel more at peace with my life. I like knowing that the places I'm a citizen of, I have a good you know, feeling about. I didn't have that before. You may have a great feeling about your country and, and maybe you wanna give up your country's citizenship because purely financial reasons, like, that's cool too. Um, but what I really wanted to show you was, number one, you can apply for visas. Even if you had a larger list than this, you know, how many countries are you really going to, okay? Um, if you're gonna be buying real estate or having homes in certain countries following our trifecta method, for example, you can get residence permits in those countries, okay? You may occasionally have to change your travel plans in that, you know, if you live in Malaysia and you also have a home in Colombia as I do, um, you know, flying through Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, you need a visa just to fly through. 
And so, okay, you're going to fly through, you know, from Malaysia to Turkey and then Turkey to Bogota, something like that. Uh, and so you have to change your travel plans to fly through an airport that's more friendly. Other than that, even if this list was longer, you can get visas. As I've said numerous times, you know, most countries don't care. Uh, I've gone to a lot of countries as a non-U.S. Uh, citizen. Occasionally, on rare occasion, they'll be like, do you have a U.S. passport? Because it says, you know, place of birth. Or they'll have, no, they'll have gone there in the past with a U.S. passport. I say no. <laughs> and generally speaking, within a couple of minutes, we just move on and in I go. They don't care where you're from, all right? You know, the Kuna countries, maybe they care a little bit more. Even then, uh, I've seen some, some pretty uh, societally objectionable people get visas to countries like Australia and New Zealand to go and actually perform. Um, and so I don't think it's a big issue. But that is kind of a look inside uh, my ability to travel. And again, if you want to live in Mexico, get a visa. If you want to live in Canada uh, or get a residence permit, get a residence permit. You know, Paraguay, same thing. Um, and a lot of these countries um, just don't matter. And so when you, when you hear one of these um, you know, people talking about visa-free travel, 182 countries, ask yourself, you know, how many of those countries for that expensive citizenship by investment program in Malta, how many of those 182, I'm just, I'm just making up that number, how many are you actually going to go to? Even if you are uh, a nomad who's bouncing around for business and leisure, you're probably going to go to a handful of countries. Most of them are going to be covered. You might get a long-term visa. You might get a residence permit. And I think overall, your life will be a lot more simple. And perhaps you'll even feel a bit more at peace. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? Four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your nomadic capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.